Hi, everyone. It's Kevin Sharp with another edition of A Page I Love. Today's guest, if you are a reader of a certain generation, needs no introduction. If you're a reader of a younger generation, let me throw out a few titles you may have heard of. Avengers, Justice League of America, Detective Comics, Captain America, Green Lantern, Doctor Strange. I could keep going, but I don't want to use up all of our time. Listing the man's credits, Steve Englehart, welcome to Comic Art Live. It's such a pleasure to have you. Thanks. It's nice to be here. So you, as a writer in the course of your career, have worked with a real murderer's row of talent. And I was very curious where your taste would go when we're talking about fan, art fan, Steve Englehart. So tell us what you chose to talk about today. I chose the cover for Fantastic Four number 27. And the reason is real simple. It always struck me as kind of the quintessential what Marvel was about in those in that era right this is like mid 60s for this it looks to me it has always looked to me like they said jack we need a cover and he sat down and in five minutes he banged this thing out i mean it's just sort of like pure kirby at the you know when he was really happy (laughs) (laughs) at marvel uh you know loving the whole concept of the universe they were creating together and so on and so forth and so this cover is just like Pure 60s Marvel. When would this have first uh, come to your attention? Were you an FF reader at this time? No. I started reading the FF, amazingly enough, right in the, with well, FF 49, which was right in the middle of the Galactus Silver Surfer era, which is probably why <laughs> I'm here today. You know, I was at the end of my freshman year in college and a guy in the dorm for whatever reason, because I didn't, wasn't into comics at that point, but he shoved a Ditko Spider-Man in my hand and said, you've got to read this. So I did, and I really liked it, and and went down to the local newsstand, and so entered the Marvel Universe at the end of, uh, well, the middle of 1966 with the FF. First thing I read was the FF with Galactus and Silver Surfer. But fortunately, the, the... newsstand in the little college town that I was in never really cleared off their racks. And so I was able to get like multiple months of the various Marvel things, which then introduced me to the whole soap opera ongoing continuity aspect of everything. So that summer I went back home to Indianapolis, which is where I am from and spent the summer sort of going around to, you know, antique stores used thing stores and they all had a box of used comics for a nickel and so i'm happy to say i was able to get spider-man number one for a nickel i was able to get you know all these various things and it was that summer that i sort of filled in the the marvel universe going backwards from 1966 and so that's when i would have seen this cover for the first time you know that was like the first summer of marvel love it was summer (laughs) you know all that stuff and so this thing just really jumped out at me as kind of like the quintessential this is what marvel is right it's fun very interestingly drawn it's so simple in a way i mean so archetypal although sue's head's a little small i think but this to me is is 60s marvel when you look at this cover now as as a seasoned professional, at removing yourself from the young man who found it in that summer, what are the elements of this cover that jump out to you today? When I went to work at Marvel, Marie Severin was, was the color coordinator there, and it was a bullpen, and so everybody hung out with everybody. I mean, there was no cast distinction between the, the young guy who just got there and everybody who'd already been there. Marie said to me once, the secret of Marvel covers is that you can tell what they're doing from across the room. She was pointing out the DC covers in those eras. They like to use a lot of color shading and darkness. And, you know, it it might have been a more artistic piece of work at the end of the day. But with a Marvel cover, you could be across the room and you could see it, which she thought, and I agreed, was like a genius way to sell things right and so that's what you know this cover you could 
step far away from your computer, kids, and you can still tell what's going on on this cover. It's got Reed looking heroic. It's got the torch going into action. It's got the Submariner looking anti-heroic. It's got a green guy in the background <laughs> doing stuff. The combination of elements, I mean, there's there's six people on that cover, and yet it's completely legible from across the room. It is it is a poster. You know, Marvel covers were posters. It's got everything it needs to have, and it's interesting looking, and I'm, I'm sure it took Kirby five minutes to draw that. Did you ever meet Kirby during your time at Marvel? Yes, and and afterwards as well. I'm you know I'm not uh, Mark Evanier. I didn't hang out with him, but um, I was actually over at DC one day when he was um, had just come over there, just you know gone over to do the Fourth World, and he took a bunch of us to to dinner just because we were just standing around. And he you know and I was I mean I was nobody, but I mean he just sort of you guys you guys want to go to dinner? Let's go to dinner. And then, you know, at various conventions, San Diego, so on and so forth. Well, because we're on the Comic Art Live channel, I have to hit you with this question. Do you own or have you ever owned any Kirby original art? Uh, no, I don't think so. And I would probably know. But I, I have an art collection. It's all stuff that was given to me over the years. I never bought anything, you know, so I never worked. Kirby never gave me anything, so I don't have anything from him, no. Well, Steve, thank you again for your time and for giving us an excuse to look at a dynamic Kirby cover from, you know, as you said, prime Marvel era. You're welcome.